Welcome to the Social Science Matrix. Uh, my name is Marion Fourcade and I am a Director of Social Science Matrix at UC Berkeley. And it is an immense pleasure to welcome you to our book discussion today devoted to Paul Pearson in Jacob Hacker's book, Let Them Eat Tweets, How the Right Rules in an Age of Extreme Inequality. For those of you who are uh, new to Matrix, we are a cross-disciplinary social science institute. Today's event is part of our Author Meets Critics series, which features critically engaged discussions about recently published books by social scientists at UC Berkeley. For each event, the author discusses the key argument of their book with fellow scholars. If you haven't already, we encourage you to sign up for our newsletter and to check out our events page. And we are very excited uh, about our events uh, lined up this fall. Uh, in November, we have an author meets critic session devoted to Professor Rosemary Joyce's book, The Future of Nuclear Waste. And in the spring semester, we will have book sessions devoted to Steve Weber's uh, Block by Block and Jovan Scott Lewis, Lewis uh, Scammer's Yard. I also want to mention another series of program which we call Matrix on Point. Uh, these are panel discussions on urgent matters of the moment. Um, in the coming weeks, we have panels dedicated to a number of important topics. So next week, for instance, we have a panel on the pandemic election in the United States. In November, we'll consider the rise of democratically elected authoritarians around the globe. And in December, we'll have a panel on the economic impacts of COVID-19, as well as another one about climate migration. So now with, without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator who in turn will introduce our wonderful guests. So Irene Blumrad is my colleague and the class of 1951 uh, professor of sociology at UC Berkeley. She also serves as the Thomas Gordon Barnes Chair of Canadian, Canadian Studies, the founding director of the Berkeley Interdisciplinary Migration Initiative and as co-director of the Boundaries Membership and Belonging uh, Program of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. She studies how immigrants become incorporated into political communities and the consequences of their presence on politics and understandings of membership. Standing at the intersection of immigration studies and political sociology, her research has been published in journals spanning sociology, political science, history, and ethnic and migration studies. She has also an, uh, and edited an array of publications, including the Handbook of Citizenship, Rallying for Immigrant Rights, Civic Hopes and Political Realities, and Becoming a Citizen. So Irene, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much to our guests. And without further ado, let's begin. All right, thank you very much, Marion. Um, happy Tuesday, everybody. I'm very glad that you can join us, whether you are somewhere in the Bay Area or a little bit further afield. Um, I was mentioning to our panelists before we started that one of the advantages of Zoom, at least in our, in our strange current world, is that we can welcome a much broader geographic scope of people in our events than we normally can. And so um, a, sp a particular shout out and welcome to those who are able to join us who would not be able to normally come to Berkeley events. The Matrix is a wonderful place to have interdisciplinary conversations and we're very glad that you could join us. So I'm first going to introduce our two speakers, Paul Pearson and Jacob Hacker, and then I'm going to introduce our two commentators, Theta Scotchpole and Chris Parker. And I'm gonna go through all the introductions rather than do it before each person speaks so that we can just move seamlessly from one to the other, at least that's our Zoom hope. Um, so without further ado, Paul Pearson is the John Gross Professor of Political Science at UC Berkeley. His teaching and research spans the fields of American politics and public policy, comparative political economy and social theory. Paul is an active commentator on public affairs. Many of you have probably read some of his work because his writings have appeared in outlets such as the New York Times Magazine, the Washington Post, and the New Republic. Paul's uh, co-author, Jacob Hacker, is the Stanley Resser Professor of Political Science and Director of the Institution for Social and Policy Studies at Yale University, a regular media commentator just like Paul, 
Uh, Jacob is the author or co-author of five books, numerous journal articles, and has been writing about American politics and public policy in a range of venues. Professor Hacker is known for writing on health policy and especially his development of the so-called public option. Now, in addition to their new book, Let Them Eat Tweets, which we're going to hear about very shortly, uh, Paul and Jacob have co-authored or authored multiple books, including American Amnesia, uh, How the War on Government Led Us to Forget What Made American Prosper, um, which was a New York Times book review editor's choice uh, book, the New York Times bestseller Winner Take All Politics, How Washington Made the Rich Richer and Turned Its Back on the Middle Class, and the book Off Center, The Republican Revolution and the Erosion of American Democracy. Now, commenting on the book, we are really fortunate to have two amazing political scientists and political sociologists, because I'm going to claim sociology in everybody. Um, we have, first of all, Theda Scotchpole, who is the Victor S. Thomas Professor of Government and Sociology at Harvard University. She was previously the Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Harvard and Director of the Center for American Political Studies. Theda's work covers a broad spectrum of topics, including both comparative politics as well as American politics, and she has written books and articles on such issues as revolutions, social policy, health policy reform, the Tea Party, and Republican Party extremism. Um, and I also want to do a quick shout out uh, for an organization that Theta founded in 2011, the Scholar Strategy Network. This is an organization of university-based scholars who are committed to using research to improve policy and strengthen democracy. It's nonpartisan, has over 1,400 scholars, I believe, in 270 universities across 48 states of the United States. And I'm, uh, under, I'm sort of underscoring it in particular for our audience because the Scholar Strategy Network has a really great faculty guide about voter registration, voter education, and voter turnout. So for all of the instructors listening in, you might wanna take a quick peek um, as we are currently uh, in election season, as if, I don't know, you'd have to have probably been in a hole, I don't know where, at the bottom of the ocean, um, not to have understood that. But I wanted to let you all know that there are those resources there for faculty. And our second uh, panelist who will be commenting on Let Them Eat Tweets is Christopher Sebastian Parker. He is the Stuart A. Scheingold Professor of Social Justice and Political Science in the Department of Political Science at the University of Washington. His first book, Fighting for Democracy, Black Veterans and the Struggle Against White Supremacy in, post, in the Post-War South, was the winner of the American Political Science Association's Ralph J. Bunch Award. Um, Professor Parker has also written on the Tea Party. His second book, Change They Can't Believe in, The Tea Party and Reactionary Politics in America, written with colleague Matt Barreto, won the American Political Science Award for Best Book in Race, Ethnicity, and Politics. And his new book, currently in progress, is tentatively entitled The Great White Hope, Donald Trump, Race, and the Crisis of American Democracy. Um, so as you can tell, we have just a, an amazing set of panelists and commentators. And without further ado, I am going to hand it over to Paul and Jacob, who will be speaking for approximately 15 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of commentary, first by Professor Scotchpole, then by Professor Parker, and then we will move into Q&A. And feel free to be typing in your Q&A questions throughout this event. Paul, Jacob, I'm not sure which of you want to go first? I'm, a, I'm actually going to go first. Um, and uh, I'm going to share my screen in just a moment. Um, but I want to just very quickly say, uh, say thanks uh, to everyone involved in putting this together. Thanks to the um, to Matrix um, and that, the incredible lineup of events. It's really a, a, an honor to be part of this lineup. And I'm going to jump right in because we have very limited time. Um, and I am very eager to get to hear um, what our discussants have to say. Uh, on this topic because uh, among other things, I think that these are uh, the two authors of the two best books on the Tea Party, um, which I think is uh, critical for understanding how we got to where we are. So I'm, I'm just very eager to, to uh, move forward and I'll try to be uh, very efficient in um, presenting uh, my part of this. Uh, so um, 
the subtitle of the book uh, mentions extreme inequality, uh, and that's where I want to start because I think that's what uh, really got us going on this project. Jacob and I was feeling that the uh, dramatic shift in the distribution of economic resources in the United States was not being sufficiently uh, considered in uh, in a discussion of where Donald Trump comes from and how he came uh, uh, to occupy the position in American politics that he did. So let me just start with a few slides about this. Um, and I'll start the first slide about inequality. This is the good news slide, but unfortunately it's not a slide uh, that applies to the United States. It's a slide of uh, the changing shares of, the, of income of the top 1% in Western Europe uh, and the bottom 50% in Western Europe um, uh, from 1980 to 2016. And you can see there is some growth of inequality by th this measure over this period, but not very much. The story in the United States looks dramatically different, right? Where the share um, of the, the bottom 50% in income has fallen by almost half and the share of uh, the top 1% has almost doubled. And those of you who have followed the uh, shifting economic fortunes in the United States well, know that in some ways this doesn't even capture how extreme the shift has been because if you were to zero in on the top tenth of one percent or the top one hundredth of one percent uh, shift the focus uh, to the plutocrats um, you would see that the gains in income have been even more dramatic uh, than what is told in the in this uh, slide uh, but i wanted to highlight just at the outset the contrast between the united states and the europe and Europe on this dimension because there is a tendency to lump what's happening in the United States together with uh, the explosion of right-wing populism that you see in various countries in Western Europe. And of course, there are important similarities that are worth considering, uh, but this suggests that there are also very dramatic differences. Uh, and that's the takeoff point for, uh, for the discussion uh, that we launch in our book. We argue um, that, uh, big rise in inequality like this poses three major challenges uh, for democratic politics. Uh, it involves a shift in the distribution of political power, a radical shift, and you could amplify that by bringing in things like the decline of labor unions in the United States. Uh, the share of campaign, federal campaign contributions coming from the top 10th of 1% of contributors has grown from about 10% of all con contributions in the early 1980s to almost 50% in 2018, right? So there's a huge shift uh, in the balance of, of economic power and economic or organization. Uh, the second reason why it's a threat is because as inequality grows, there's likely to be more of a divergence of preferences and interests between the wealthy and everyone else. And that's basically just logic, right? That if, if people are much, much further apart in their circumstances, and if more and more of the economic rewards are being concentrated at the top, uh, that's likely to mean that the things that are going to benefit ordinary citizens in the economic sphere are not going to be beneficial uh, to those economic elites. Uh, and then the final point really following uh, from, from the second one, with that divergence of preference, elites, economic elites, are likely to become more suspicious of democracy. Right? They're, going to, they're going to be working harder to make sure uh, that voters are not going to use their numbers uh, to, uh, to overcome uh, and possibly redistribute the economic resources uh, that, are, that are increasingly concentrated at the top. Now, we suggest in the book that actually, because this, what's happened in the US is pretty different from what's been going on in Europe, that we might want to look elsewhere uh, to make sense of it. And one place that we look for trying to understand this is a book by, I have to mention, Berkeley PhD, uh, Daniel Ziblatt, wonderful book that won the, uh, won the Wilson Prize in uh, political science a few years ago, Conservative Parties and the Birth of Democracy. Uh, so he was looking at the late 19th, early 20th century. I had some conversations with Daniel about, about this project when he was working on it. We shared an office uh, for, a, for a month or so and had lots of conversations where we were kind of freaked out about the parallels uh, between early 20th century Germany and uh, uh, early 21st century America. Uh, but one thing that he highlights there is that conservative parties face a big challenge in societies that are democratizing uh, because it, 
conservative parties are tied to an economic elites, uh, but now non-elites are gaining uh, political resources and political power. So how does a conservative party respond to that? Uh, they, they're pulled in different directions. And of course, they're likely in many cases to moderate somewhat on economic issues, but they're unlikely to be able to outbid the left on these issues in any event. And so Ziblatt argues and provides a lot of historical documentation for this, and we supplement that in our book, um, that what you're likely to see is um, politicians uh, trying to refocus conflict, conservative politicians refocusing conflict on non-economic issues, what political scientists sometimes call second dimension issues. Uh, think of things like nationalism, religious divides, ethnic divides, racial divides, uh, these are all ways in which you can shift the conversation in politics and the attention of voters away from economic issues towards uh, social issues. Um, and this has happened in the United States. And now I'm going to have to uh, telescope very quickly, but uh, one, there are a lot of accounts of what's happened in the United States that basically say the establishment wing of the Republican Party, the Chamber of Commerce, Koch brothers, wing of the Paul Ryan wing of the Republican Party was overthrown by the Trump wing. Um, and there's some, there's some element of truth uh, to that story, but only a little bit, and it leaves a lot on the side. Remember, Mitch McConnell, the plutocrat's best friend, described 2017 as the best year for conservatives in the 30 years that he'd been in Washington, the best year on all fronts. And Charles Koch similarly said, we've done more in the last five years than I had in the previous 50. Uh, the plutocrats, corp, large corporate America and, uh, and the very, very wealthy have done fantastically well uh, from the last few years of Republican governance, better than they ever did, say, under George W. Bush. And a reminder, the hearings that are going on, the Supreme Court hearings that are going on right now, there, there's a nice op-ed in the Times this morning pointing out all the money that Charles Koch and the Koch Brothers Network uh, put in over an extended period of time to produce the kind of Supreme Court majority that they are about to consolidate. Uh, and they're not doing that because they care about religious liberties or abortion issues, right? They're doing it because they expect to see uh, a, a liber an economically libertarian a set of policies uh, cemented by that, that Supreme Court. Um, so plutocrats have been doing extremely well. They have not been doing extremely well because they're doing things that are popular. Um, if I could force every political scientist in the United States who studies American politics to sit in a room and watch this slide, I would lock the door and make them watch it for half an hour to really absorb the message here, right? Which is that these are, the most important pieces of legislation, domestic legislation discussed in Washington, brought to a vote in the last uh, 30 years. And you can see how they polled around the time that they were up for consideration, averaging across a lot of polls. Typically politicians try to enact things that are pretty popular, right? At least with respect to their flagship legislation. That's become harder to do over time because we're so polarized. So you can see as you move closer to the present, a lot of these bills have sort of middling uh, popularity. Uh, but there are two huge outliers. Uh, we call them unicorns because they're things that in a democratic polity you should not expect to see happen, right? Which is that a party advances hugely unpopular items as their flagship proposals in Congress. But under Donald Trump and the Republican majority, you've got two unicorns in less than two years, right? The tax cut bill and the, uh, the attempt to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, both of which were designed to pull hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars uh, away from ordinary Americans towards those at the very top of the income distribution. Um, that is a stunning change. And it is not a change that has much to do with economic populism. Um, I'm going to uh, turn this over to Jacob now. I just want to, just as a way of making the transition, uh, I just want to highlight that, as Ziblatt argues, and we agree, uh, a conservative party trying to deal with this dilemma, who insists on trying to continue to advance 
or even accelerate the advancement of plutocratic policies uh, is going to have to really push these second uh, dimension uh, demands. Uh, and if the party itself is not that organizationally strong, it is likely to turn to, su to surrogates who are good at stoking outrage, at generating outrage and fury around issues that in the American context turned out to be issues uh, of white identity. Right? So you get in the United States not right-wing populism, but plutocratic populism uh, that involves uh, this kind of alliance. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Jacob for the rest of the story. Great, thanks, Paul. Um, and uh, let me just put up a few slides as well. Um, and I will be brief. Um, and and uh, I would say that um, just at the, at the outset, I just want to say that um, this was billed as author meets critics, but I hope that the better way to describe it is authors meet inspirations because, <laughs> and that's not to head off any criticism, but it's just to say that both of uh, these these uh, so-called critics are people who have really inspired our work. And Theta in particular has had a really profound impact on both of us. Um, and what I wanna talk about is what, the way in which I think we've, 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 we've built on her emphasis on organizations and elites um, and how they interact with, um, with voters. And also to then turn to our second inspiration to talk a bit about the ways in which we bring in this interaction between elites and ordinary voters, we bring race in much more front, uh, centrally than we have in the past, something that Chris has really pushed us to do with his work. So Paul has already talked about the fundamental role of extreme inequality. Um, I wanna talk uh, a little bit about this, uh, what he started to talk about, which is the way in which the, the Republican elites um, in their pursuit of, of relatively unpopular policies that benefit the plutocrats. And I would extend that to include um, some policies that uh, we did, that Paul didn't have time to talk about, the, just the executive branch um, efforts to scale back and gut regulations and uh, with consumer and financial and labor protections, and also uh, to roll back healthcare protections through executive action, that these efforts, unpopular efforts, were not um, a way of attracting voters. And so the question becomes, how does the Republican Party build uh, a powerful party base? And, and Paul started to talk about something that we draw out of Zeblatt's book, namely the way in which the, a party has a hard time appealing um, to voters um, voters' deep identities and needs to rely on surrogate groups, that, as particularly ones that specialize in the politics of outrage. So on the screen, you can see the cover of the covers of American Rifleman, um, which is the NRA's publication. And I think I need not elaborate on the picture because it really sums up the changing way in which the National Rifle Association saw itself relative to government and relative uh, to um, the partisan fights. And so what was an organization that presented a relatively moderate um, outdoorsman face, right, becomes an organization that um, uh, particularly starting in the mid 1990s, right, that's emphasizing this hard edged uh, anti-government uh, ideology with an emphasis on um, on the idea of the Second Amendment and guns as a defense against a tyrannical uh, government. And of course, the party, uh, the NRA becomes much more aligned with the Republican Party. The same is true, though, with different themes and different organizations of the Christian right. Um, and it's also true of an organization that, um, that Theta's book on the Tea Party shows um, is actually comes to play a really critical role as a kind of social movement leader for profit, namely right wing media. And this is um, another, sorry, I'll skip this. This is another respect in which the, the, um, the American uh, landscape is, is distinctive, right? That we have um, this uh, ecosystem of right wing media that's highly um, has a highly concentrated uh, audience um, that is highly reliant on it, that is um, w willing and capable of deploying um, highly racialized um, and an anti-government themes in a, in a way that turns out to be mobilizing uh, for a core group of voters. And so let me just um, 
let me just in the last minute or so talk a little bit about how this fits into uh, our take on race. Um, so the first thing I want to say, as I acknowledged earlier, is that in our previous work, um, Paul and I uh, did not pay enough attention to the way in which the Republican Party came to, to exploit racial backlash. And the um, and I think that as a result, I, I want to be careful in, um, in, in, in what I say next, because we do have a critique of, of, of some of the work that emphasizes race because it focuses too much on the, uh, the pervasive racism that exists in American society and not enough on the strategies that elites are using uh, to, um, to both foment and exploit it in partisan conflict. So the point is to come back to Paul's emphasis on the conservative dilemma and the way in which the Republican Party is distinctively encouraged and incentive, incent, incentivized to um, use race as a means of mobilizing um, white voters, um, particularly those outside of urban centers. And if we integrate this kind of top down and bottom up perspective, we can really understand, I think, better um, the role that race and racial backlash has played in, um, in recent American politics and in particularly the rise of Trump. So this figure that I switched over very quickly comes from Lee Drutman. And what it shows, if you look at it, it has two dimensions. One is an economic dimension. So this is the standard right-left divide on size of government and, um, and the welfare state. Uh, and the other divide here is, is a social identity dimension, which is uh, very close to the kind of racial resentment scores, but also includes anti-immigrant sentiments um, and views towards Muslims. And you can see that there are a lot, that there are two groups that are very homogenous. There are the blue people, the blue folks in the bottom left, and there are the red folks in the top right. And those are the, the Democratic voters who are liberal on both these dimensions and the Republican voters who are conservative on both. But first, there's not a lot of people who are conservative on uh, the social identity dimension, but uh, uh, I mean, conservative on the economic dimension, but fairly liberal on the social identity dimension. This, you know, those would be the, the libertarian voters. Um, and uh, they, these also is just worth noting, a lot of the plutocrats would place themselves probably in, in this quadrant if they uh, were pressed. But there is, um, but there are a lot of voters who are conservative on social identity issues, but relatively liberal on economics. And these were the voters that were decisive for Donald Trump. They're also the voters that the Republican Party has been appealing to, even as it's become more and more plutocratic. So the point is that to attract those voters, they've really had to double down and amplify these appeals to white identity. Um, so we're not denying that there's a huge fertile field. And Chris's analysis of the Tea Party in particular really shows the extent to which they're uh, underlying a lot of the calls for constitutional conservatism or limited government are really strong reactions against uh, demographic change. Theta, Theta's book with Vanessa Williamson emphasizes this too. But I don't think we should forget that there's also the central role for plutocracy and for the Republican Party in exploiting this. So with that, let me stop there and just say one last thing, which is the last point that we emphasize in the book that we haven't had time to talk about, but I wanna put on the table, is that because this movement, if you will, um, unites uh, uh, a tiny minority at the top and those sympathetic to them and a larger um, group uh, but nonetheless minority that is uh, it, reacting against uh, economic and cultural change, um, it is inherently a kind of counter-majoritarian or minoritarian project. And so I just want to put on the table that this helps explain why Republicans have worked so aggressively to exploit weaknesses on our political institutions, as well as just basic features of them that have allowed them to protect themselves against um, electoral accountability. And this is another theme that Zblatt's uh, book um, uh, uh, draws out. So with that, um, I want to just say thanks for having us. And I look forward to Chris and Theta's reactions. All right. Thank you very much, both Paul and Jacob. And as we move back to no sharing, I am going to now turn this over to Theta Scotchpool. Hi everyone. Um, 
I'm glad to take part in this discussion uh, and uh, to have a chance to talk about this fascinating new book. Uh, Jacob and Paul's book is powerful, like all of the books that they have written. Um, and I appreciate the fact that it's written for a general public audience as well as for academics. Actually, I would say in this case, even more for a general public audience. In many ways, this one repeats and extends arguments from their previous books, and I would say especially my favorite among them, off-center and winner-take-all politics. Uh, of course, this one hones in specifically on synthesizing scholarly and journalistic writing about the evolution of the U.S. Republican Party, which I agree with them is the, what we should be focusing on uh, apart from Donald Trump himself. Um, the book argues that the GOP has evolved steadily since the 1980s toward using all the levers available in the U.S. constitutional and federal system to further non-majoritarian governing agendas, and it suggests that in recent years, and especially under Trump, it's teetering on the edge of outright authoritarian politics. It's a descriptively rich book, and I especially appreciate the new ground Hacker and Pearson made in Chapter 3. Um, Jacob hinted at that with that wonderful slide about the NRA. Um, the chapter called Organizing Through Outrage, where they present a, a series of compelling overviews of the importance of the right-wing media complex, the gun, uh, um, uh, gun um, world <laughs> centered on the NRA, but not only the NRA, and the Christian right uh, complex, which is grounded in churches where people uh, actually find meaning in their lives in vast stretches of America, but also linked to various media empires. Um, and I think I would only say that they make points there that I think augment in many ways uh, the points about the local reach of those popularly anchored complexes that Michael Zurab and I made in chapter four of our new of the new book uh, Upending American Politics. Uh, where we talk about the surprising organizational bases of Trump's 2016 uh, Electoral College victory. And we take it one step further, which I would encourage people to think about, showing the importance of the fraternal order of police. Uh, and that's very similar to other um, border guards, uh, prison guards. Um, and yet another popularly rooted federated network that links to an apocalyptic right-wing worldview of the kind championed by Trump. And also suggests some of the proto-violence and the antipathy toward Black Lives Matter uh, that uh, has been central in these last few years. Now, it won't surprise people that beyond the descriptives I'm talking about here and the appreciative things to say, I have some critical things to say. And they have to do with the apparent causal argument in this book. And I have to say the causal argument is in some ways buried because it, there is no exploration of alternative hypotheses here. Maybe that's to be done in another uh, kind of publication. Um, from my reading, I think the overall causal argument is that the GOP's non-maturitarian evolution has been consistently and almost monomaniacally driven by the top 1% billionaires and millionaires in an era where they have gained more income and wealth at the expense of the bottom 50%. Now, Paul and Jacob certainly acknowledge that there are a fair number of centrist and liberal-minded super wealthy. In fact, my reading is that they're a third to 40% of the super wealthy in this country. Uh, but their argument seems to be that uh, it is the right-wing people who have managed to capture the, the t organizational tools needed to manipulate mass support and to, to make, take advantage of the non-majoritarian features that are built into US politics and always have been. Um, so, um, and they uh, focus mainly on the lack of accountability for policy uh, perspectives that are not in line with what polls show us the majority would like. Now, I'd like to have seen a lot more precision about the various um, partly in tension organizational networks that are in play in and around the Republican Party. Uh, first of all, I think the Republican Party itself is a set of organizations and those are neglected here and their inability to, uh, uh, to maintain any kind of control is not probed enough. But aside from that, Tea Partiers, for example, have their own organizational capacities 
that they created that have enabled uh, popular forces across the country to further what I would call an ethno-nationalist worldview that is not at all the same as the free market people. And that means that they are an independent force that is not entirely married to the free market folks, even though they've fused perfectly in the Trump administration. Um, the other tension that Jacob and Paul downplay is between corporate elites and managers and the ultra wealthy as individuals and families. And yet you cannot understand why Medicaid has expanded steadily since 2012 in Republican led and dominated states and indeed has advanced even in the Trump era without understanding the, dis the, the conflicts of interest between some corporate capitalists, especially in the health sector and uh, ultra rich elites furthering a, a free market agenda. So um, it's always important to understand how elites are divided because it is out of those divisions that come the ability to push them back. Um, the other glaring admissions, I'll just tick off very quickly. I don't think you can analyze one political party in a two party system without analyzing the other major party. Um, the Democratic Party left vast stretches of political geography and um, issue areas and voter mobilization open for the other side to exploit. And so we need to understand what has happened to the Democratic Party in this period to understand the Republican Party. Um, I see very little political economy in this argument, which really surprised me given Paul's political economy. I think out there in the country, there are industrial sectors, small business sectors, medium-sized business sectors that see a real positive set of positives for their economic interests and their workers see the, those interests too. Um, and so I would, I think one needs to, to show how different industrial sectors and business sectors have played out over the American geography in this recent period. And finally, what about immigration? If we look over the course of American history, we see every time African Americans make progress in terms of political power and rights, there is a fierce, fierce counter reaction to that. Every time there's an era of mass immigration from new groups of people, there is a fierce counter reaction to that. The Obama era brought the coincidence of my God from the perspective of, of ordinary people on the right, a black president with political power and the end of an era of mass immigration that brought new groups from Central America, Asia and Africa into the United States. There are real fears and real angers growing in that brew and it's that coincidence that I don't think it's discussed because immigration is out, left out. The final thing I'm gonna say is that this book talks about one of the kinds of growing inequality in this period, the 1% versus the bottom 50%. But it never even mentions the 20% versus the 80%. The fact that the top 20% of professionals and managers and the people who have given floods of money to the Democratic Party since Obama have been pulling away from everybody else. And that matters because a lot of the ordinary middle income and low income whites who support the GOP don't just resent and fear immigrants and politically powerful black people, they also resent the key components of the elite side of the democratic coalition, the college educated, career oriented, high income earning uh, people who make up the other part of the democratic party's coalition. And the difference has to do with clashes of what's meaningful in life and uh, church going versus non-church going, metropolitan cosmopolitan versus uh, uh, more local, uh, way of life um, and status, the sense of entitled uh, experts telling other people what to do. Those inequalities have also been growing in exactly the same period and they have been uh, pretty important in weakening um, 
the Democratic Party's ability to appeal to many of the white collar and lower income uh, whites that uh, have gone, have defected to the GOP. I'm gonna close by saying that although it's not fair, I don't think this book gives us much of a sense of what's happened in American politics since the pandemic hit, maybe even what's happened since 2016. Yes, it tells us why the tax cuts passed. It doesn't really tell us why the GOP dropped the effort to repeal the ACA after a vote failed by one vote. It doesn't tell us why a massive blue wave fueled by grassroots citizens groups that are even more extensive across the country and even more powerful than the Tea Parties helped to take back the House for the Democrats in 2018, expand the ranks of the voting electorate, and stands poised along with the forces of organized minorities in and around the Democratic Party and young people to perhaps deliver the Senate as well as the House of the Presidency to the Democrats. And while all this happened with somebody as bland as Biden uh, at the top of the ticket. So I don't think we get much insight into that. We don't get much insight into why the ACA has survived, even though it is the most redistributive law that has been passed in this period why Social Security and Medicare are still with us. I think the monological right-wing top 1% takeover of US politics that this book portrays in an accurate but exaggerated way cannot be the only thing going on here uh, because uh, if it were, um, we wouldn't be where we are right now and are likely to be in three weeks. I think US politics is very bleak, but I don't think it's as bleak as this book portrays it. All right, bleak, but not that bleak. That, that is a great uh, ending. We are now going to be turning to Chris Parker, and I want to remind our audience to uh, please uh, type in your questions through the Q&A function. So because we're doing this as a Zoom webinar, we have to take your questions through Q&A. You'll find that at the bottom, hopefully, of your Zoom window. And now I'm going to turn it over to Professor Parker. Hi, um, thanks for the invitation. I'm thrilled to be on this panel. Um, I've read all your works. So yes, I'm gonna make you guys feel old since I was graduating, <laughs> okay? So um, it, it, this is like the second or third time I've, I've served on a panel with Theta. And I think this is the first time I had to go after her. And we're probably gonna be another panel again at some point remind me not to let you go before me because <laughs> I got nothing left to say really, right? I'm just taking stuff off. Uh, <laughs> so I have to be good cop, I guess, and I'm not accustomed to that role. <laughs> so what I will say is um, I totally agree. Uh, well, first of all, I, I really like reading the book, um, extremely well read, and, um, and more of the general public needs to be involved in this conversation. The prose is really accessible. And I think the arguments were really provocative. Um, and I have to confess, I never really thought about this approach before. So having said that, um, I'll get right to some of the questions that I have. Uh, the first of which is, there's an absence of notable, well, first of all, I have to agree with Theta in that, you know, the idea that, you know, that we had our first black president and that this was a reaction and that this is, you know, this sort of action reaction kind of thing we generally see in American politics, you know, you know, I tend to think of this in terms of that, with that sort of intellectual framework. Now, having said that, I, I, I want to ask, I want to pose a question about social movements and the relative absence of social movements in the analysis. Um, and so what I'll do right now is seed home field advantage, if I will, if I could. So there was another time in American history, in the 20th century, um, in the early part of the 20th century, during the Gilded Era, that we saw massive amounts of inequality. Um, and, uh, but we didn't see any sort of racial conflict at the behest of, of the plutocrats, right? So, and, and they had reason to feel threatened, right? Because that was during the reform or the progressive era, the reform era, right? And so one would think that if something was gonna scare the plutocrats, it wouldn't scare them then. Um, and we would have seen more racial division or stoking racial division at that point in history. But we didn't see that. Um, yes, once again, I want to stress that we had the 100% American campaign, um, you know, and we had 
the, of course, that was a height of Jim Crow, but that was a sectional thing mainly. Um, so it wasn't something on a national scale. So that if your theory or your approach is correct, then we should have seen plutocrats try to stoke racial division, but we didn't. We did, however, see racial division stoked on the part of, let's say, the Klan, for example, in these 100% American campaigns. Um, and so, but, and so what, what I want to do is I want to draw on the work of, uh, um, work of Doug McAdam and Amanda Clues, you know, who wrote a book that, and, and if I'm reading your work correctly, is that one of the major threats to American democracy right now is polarization. So if we work backwards from that, um, that we have these, this effective polarization that's pushing the Republican Party, among other things, further and further to the right. Well, one of the things that, that McCannum and Clues show is that in the absence of a political party that's pulling either, excuse me, a, a movement pulling either party to the left or right, we don't really have much in the way of polarization, right? And that's something that was absent back during uh, the reform era and during, uh, during the era that preceded um, the Great Depression. There was no real political movement. There was a Klan, but that wasn't based on, on they, they didn't form on at the behest of plutocrats, right? So, but we did see that. And so I was wondering sort of what role social movements play. And of course, now we see that we saw the Tea Party. Now, I, I appreciate what you said about, you know, the work that Matt and I did um, and, um, and as it uh, informed your approach to this book. Um, but we see, I saw nothing much in the way of Tea Party in this book, right? And as other people have written that without the Tea Party, it's unlikely we get Trump. But without Obama, it's highly unlikely we get the Tea Party, right? And it's part of this dynamic, right? This progress of re regress, racial progress, and then we see this racial regress, right? It happens over and over again. So that's one thing. And so this leads into another uh, question that I have. Can your approach rule out um, a counter narrative that rests on racial threat or the perception of racial threat? And your account incorporates it to the extent that it is a tool that is used by plutocrats. But the issue is, I don't think, you know, white folks needed plutocrats to tell them that there was a racial threat. You know, when Obama got elected, that was it for everybody, right? Not everybody, but that really frightened them, right? And that's what Matt and I show in our book, um, you know, in all kinds of ways, right? It was a threat that Obama posed to the status quo. And this idea like, uh-oh, we're losing our country. And what and we all know what the president represents symbolically in America, right? It's a huge symbolic representation of the nation. It represents the face of the nation abroad and the face of government at home. So the symbolism that's associated with the American presidency, you know, cannot be overstated. Um, and when you have a black man in the White House, all bets were off at that point. And so to the extent that your argument um, hinges on this idea that it was plutocrats that really started and stoked these racial divisions, especially after 2008. I, I'd have to push back on that a little bit and ask whether or not your account can, can accommodate this, this counter narrative. Um, so a third question I, I would like to ask is, why exactly are there people so loyal to the GOP? So on the surface, it's about you know, it's about the, 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 the plutocrats say, okay, we're really ripping you guys off over here. So go chase this bright, shiny object over there. But how long is that supposed to last, right? And so, and maybe this is not fair. I, I actually have an answer to this about the social psychological mechanism that undergirds this. You, you know, you say it's white identity and I kind of get that, but I think it's actually deeper and more enduring than that. Um, and to the extent, you know, we're referencing white identity to the extent that you know, Ashley Jardina's book comments on this. One thing she doesn't do in her book is connected to white nationalism, right? Um, and I think that's really important. So it's, it's a lot more complicated than just white identity. And the third thing I would want to ask is, or like the question I would like to pose, is what's the difference between the United States and Europe? And I ask that question because we see there's not much in the way of inequality in Europe, yet we see these reactionary movements in Europe. So then I would like to ask, so, so is inequality um, in your framework, the way that I read it, a necessary condition for this to happen? Because in Europe, that doesn't necessarily seem to be the case, but we still see these reactionary movements in Europe. So that's all I got.
All right. Thank you very much. And I want to thank both of our commentator critics for sticking exactly to those 10 minutes, which will allow us to have lots of time for question, commentary, and exchange. Um, a reminder to everyone listening in that you can just use the Q&A function to um, uh, sort of send us your questions. And then a few people have also been chatting me directly because they might be having problems with the Q&A function. So feel free to do that if for some reason Q&A is not working for you. So I'm going to ask uh, Jacob and Paul to maybe respond uh, to, to Chris's last question first, because I also think that takes up some of the issues that Theta raised, which is, Paul, you started with that graph where you're saying Europe has different inequality than the United States. Look at how inequality has been rising in the United States. But we see nationalist populism and we see anti-immigrant and anti-race or anti-Muslim politics in Europe as well. So is it really the case that what's going on in the United States is just the plutocrats doing some false consciousness around race, or is there something else going on? Do we need to separate those things out? So, uh, so first of all, I want to thank both uh, Theodore and Chris, because unsurprisingly, super incisive uh, commentary. I would like to respond to a lot of it um, at the same time that um, I want to open things up for discussion. I will, I want to say one thing at the start, um, in connection to uh, Theta's, some of Theta's comments, most of which I actually agree with, not all of them, but most of them I actually agree with. And you may, this may feel, um, I don't know, like, like defensive, but um, if we had wanted to write a 350 page book um, that was a comprehensive analysis of what had unfolded in the US over the last 40 years, I think we would have examined a lot of the questions in more detail that you're talking about. Um, we approached this book with a view which I believe strongly, which is that the incredible shift in the balance of economic and with it political power in the United States that has occurred over the last 40 years has been underexplored in conversations about what's happening in American politics. And so we wanted to focus as much as we could building on work like that of Scotch Paul and Hertel Fernandez on the incredible role of the Koch brothers whose fingerprints are all over this administration, right? all over it. Right? Um, we wanted to focus on that and show how you can illuminate things when you bring that more centrally into the picture. Right? Um, that does not mean we think they've got control of the whole thing. I think we actually try very carefully in a spare book to talk about how this tension operates through the party and evolves over an extended period of time in which the plutocrats are gradually gaining organizational strength, but also have unleashed forces that they do not control. Right? As we say in the book, they are not Bond villains hiding in a lair underneath some volcano somewhere. Who are orchestrating everything. All right. So I think we did try to wrestle uh, with um, them being a powerful force in limiting the range of options and laser focus on trying to get the policies that they want, which they've been extremely successful in doing, uh, and, um, but not in total control of the process. You're shaking your head, but I mean, the tax cuts, okay, they didn't get the Affordable Care Act repeal through, they came within one vote, even though it polled at 20%, 20%, right? Um, so now they're going after it through the Supreme Court, right? Maybe that'll happen, maybe it won't, but we could run down the list. We do it in the book. There is a reason why the Koch, Koch brothers and why McConnell were crowing and why McConnell continues to crow. Um, so, but to Chris's point, I mean, this is what I started with was to say, uh, there are reasons why people would point to Europe because there are things going on in Europe that look similar, right? Um, so I would not say you have to have big increases in inequality to generate right-wing populism. That's clearly not true. 
I think you do have to have big increases in inequality and a shift in economic power to get plutocratic populism. Right? Um, and if you look at the policy programs of these right-wing populist forces, they look very similar to the American case with respect to you know, anti-elite rhetoric um, and anti-immigrant sentiment, but not with respect to economic policy. Right where they look, where they look dramatically different. Right. So, um, and then this, the second thing to say about that is the fact that you have support of so many of those uh, with organized with economic resources who are organizing into politics in defense of those economic interests um, that helps you gain and hold and exercise power. Right. So. A striking thing about a lot of these right-wing populist movements in Europe is they're big, but for the most part, they have not gained power. Um, and even where they do gain power, they don't use it to pursue, to relentlessly pursue a plutocratic agenda. Uh, Theda, do you want to have a very quick one-minute response since you don't seem convinced by Paul's response? Well, I just think that I want to ask the thing that Paul did not address. Why do you not talk about 2080 inequality and the various tensions and opportunities that that has generated? Because I don't think without that, you can understand um, entirely why there are vast swatches of middle class whites and working, really more middle class whites. Frankly, I don't think working class whites are the major base for the Republican Party or Trumpism. I think it's it's middle class people. People who are small contractors and military veterans. I'm, I mean, I've sat across the table from them. I've seen them, the ones who are organized and I just think they resent people like us. So um, I, think that's, I think that's right. I think here, I don't think that there'd be so many opportunities for Charles Koch. I think, that's, I think that's right. I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, the whole point is you got to get votes of a lot more people <laughs> than people who are in the top 10th of 1%. And I think you're right to point to that dynamic. The one thing I, I, I would say about that, because we haven't really, uh, Jacob, I mentioned briefly, but I don't think we really got into it. And I, I do think it's a critical dimension for thinking about how this co-evolves, if I can put it that way, right? These are complex uh, configurations. Yeah, yeah they but are. The, but the, the rural urban split, right? Um, and the way in which um, that encourages, and, and the way in which that has become partisan, right? And the way that that then feeds into political contestation where Republicans can think in terms of getting 45%, right? And winning, and Democrats have to get 55% to win. That has had very, very powerful effects. Right, especially when you have these mobilizing groups that can suck everything up into this national conflict. Right, so I actually, I mean, uh, Jacob and, and uh, uh, Jake Grumbach and I have a piece where we're trying to understand the red state political economies, right, yeah, which, okay. gets us, which gets us some of the stuff that you were asking about there. But one of the things that we say is that um, what's striking is so much of the economic agenda that Republicans are pursuing is not really beneficial to, um, to local economic elites uh, in these red states. There are some elements are, but mostly not, because they've been, able to, they've been able to draw on these regional urban cleavages, the geographic cleavages, but pull it all into this national confrontation in which uh, you know, the priorities of other kinds of economic actors are really dominating. Right. I want. I think uh, Chris might want to interject here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Irene. Um, yeah, that's one of my principal critiques. I have a whole lot of questions about the way you guys use populism. I can't stand the way. I can't. I just cannot even stand the way that this is used. Right wing populism. That's a whole bunch of bullshit. There's no such thing, right? So I don't even. I, it would take me too long to explain this, right? But just read Thomas Frank's book, right? He he and I are on the same page on this. His, his latest book, first of all. Second of all, uh, which kind of goes along with that critique, is that a lot of people make much of working class whites. But listen, two thirds of Trump supporters have incomes in the upper half of the income distribution, right? So when people say that, 
it's like, what? I don't know why people continue to buy into that, right? Like Theta said, I mean, a lot of his support comes from people who are not economically anxious. And that's one of the things I was, that was one of the things I wanted to discuss or may, make mention of about what's going on in Europe as a sort of counter narrative um, to your uh, approach that includes, you know, plutocratic populism. And I would love to talk to you guys offline about this because I had a whole bunch of ideas about this. But what I want to say is I, I pointed to Europe because I wanted to say this is really mainly about the perceived rapid change that's happening in society. I don't think it's so much about you know, plutocratic interests necessarily. I think if you look at it on a global scale, right, it's really much more about this perception of rapid social change, this status threat, if you will, that these people feel like they're losing their society. And, and I'm not suggesting that you're saying that uh, plutocratic populism is a necessary condition, right? But what I'm saying is there are other frameworks out there. Um, and I wanted to point to Europe to uh, illuminate the framework that I was proposing, the alternative that I was proposing, and that Theta hit on. This is more like about racial threat and whether or not your approach can accommodate that alternative hypothesis. And I didn't even know we were going to start talking about causality. I, I thought that was just out of bounds, and I didn't even want to go there, right? Never so out anyway. of bounds with me. <laughs> I am, I'm going to take my moderator role here to sort of uh, continue the conversation, but building on, on comments that both Theta and Chris made around social movements and organizing. Um, I'm going to combine both uh, their sort of the thrust of their question plus a question I got through chat, which is to what extent is this a story about organizing or social movements beyond plutocrats and in thinking about the organizing Theta in her work and then Chris also in his analysis of the Tea Party really puts a lot of emphasis on, on grassroots, but what role has social media also played. So if we think about the organizing and the social movements. Is there something even more going on today because of social media and the amplification of new technologies? Or, you know, is that is that less important? Is that overblown? So I'll I'll jump in. Um, and and I want to I want to emphasize something that Paul said earlier, and I didn't because I wanted to stick to time, I didn't really go into this, but that our argument is. It, it's really important to say that our argument isn't about these plutocrats kind of engineering everything, but about the ways in which the pressures that come onto the Republican Party because of its, it sits at the intersection of uh, this transformation of the political economy and the transformation of our, our demography and our society, um, that, it, that because of that, the Republican Party strategies, right, and the way in which it, it ends up uh, unleashing these forces, including social media and right wing media that it has hard time controlling how that it's really about how that is said it is is has a fundamental link to the to the extreme inequality. And so there is this same sense of racial threat and demographic threat in Europe. But as Paul was saying, it's not getting translated into a party that is simultaneously committed to shifting income up the the income ladder. And I would I would the one thing I would say on the 80-20, and I think it's a very astute point, um, is that first of all, I do think if we were writing a longer book where we really wanted to take up the Democrats, the way in which they've been cross-pressured both by their plutocrats, who, whom Theta mentioned, and by their, um, their own 20%, um, right, the top 20% within them, and how that has made it harder for them to respond to in an effective way to the way in which Republicans have, have, have organized. I think that's absolutely a very valid point. But I would say that our, I just want to be really clear about what our argument is about how the Republicans have responded, right? And um, this is a tacit alliance. It's not an explicit alliance. And it's one in which you, as we put it, the Republicans open Pandora's box, right? And so they, the racial threat that citizen, that, that white middle-class voters and working-class voters are feeling is real. But um, the Republicans are um, fomenting and building a kind of partisan tribal identity around it in a way that really has to be explored and which really links back to the fact that unlike right wing parties in Europe, they're not offering anything of tangible value in material benefits uh, to much of their base with the theta's right that there are sectors that they um, that they throw some um, some crumbs to and there's certainly a huge amount of symbolic um, action. And I'm not denying that, that these voters care deeply about their status or about uh, some social issues. But in terms of 
the kind of core welfare state programs that you see in Europe that right-wing parties, uh, right-wing populist parties defend, there's none of that within the Republican Party. Oh, and, but wait and, a minute. Social now, Security and Medicare have not been dropped, touched. Neither have military veterans policies. Those are the core social welfare policies that benefit the middle class people who support Republicans. Well, uh, they, I mean, Trump promised not, I mean, first of all, they've survived through a lot of elect of onslaughts through a lot of years. And, and Paul wrote a great book about why it's hard to dismantle the welfare state. But Trump promised to um, protect Medicaid, which is of great value mm -hmm. in many of these communities. And he went after it. He did include Medicaid among his list. Um, because he doesn't know the difference between Medicaid and Medicare. Okay, let me continue. Let me continue. So he promised to do infrastructure. He promised to control prescription drugs. Um, you know, I mean, go, go down the list, right? This is a hugely plutocratic agenda. And you say, well, we don't know. We don't have something to say about what happened after No, no, I agree that that's a plutocratic agenda. I do. Okay. Well, the point is, how do you, how do you turn a, a racial... A, a racial threat theme into a, a, a plutocratic onslaught. And I think this is what we're, we're trying to explain. So let me just get to Irene's question because I think it's really important, right? So the, 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 the role of the NRA, the Christian right and right-wing media are, and by the way, I think that's really something where we can't, as I said, we're really inspired by the way in which Theta has shown these organizational networks are central. Um, that that I think is a really important part of the story and we spent a lot of time on it because voters don't just wake up and have a kind of tribal identity to the to a party. Um, you know, the, the, the poll that that really stuck with me was in 2017, uh, a majority of white evangelical voters said there's more discrimination against Christians than against Muslims in the United States, right? That's not something that you like just come up with. It's something that, and if you watch right-wing media, and uh, I know that Vita's actually, to her credit, has spent a lot of time actually imbuing this rhetoric. I mean, it is incredibly um, potent material that, that prevents, presents a, a, a very powerful worldview and also discredits all alternative sources of information. And so we're not, we're really trying to emphasize that the process that gets set in motion where the party refuses after even after say the 2012 autopsy right and uh, when Mitt Romney um, uh, loses um, in part because he's not able to get um, substantial share of the Hispanic vote that the party refuses to moderate on economic issues it sets in motion these kind of forces that Irene is talking about and it, and in this respect, I think it's quite distinct from the kind, the way right, right wing populism. By the way, Chris, I share your concern, and I liked Frank's book, but we really are trying to use this as the sort of conventional way in which it, the term is used. I agree, ethno nationalist parties, parties would be a better term. But, but anyway, we're tr we're very clear about what it is, right? And it is, and 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 in particular, we're very clear that what it is in the U.S. is plutocratic right-wing populism, right? So I'll stop there, but I, I really do, I really feel like that, you know, we're really trying to make an argument about the interplay of these forces, not about plutocrats sort of sitting there and engineering things. And it feels, it feels kind of unfair to, to, have, to get pinned with that. I'll take the other criticism, but that one doesn't seem right to me. Thank you very much, Jacob. And I, I want to say that I'm, I'm very happy about the, the discussion around immigration and race. Um, and not only was Obama the first black president, but his father was born in another country. And Kamala yeah. Harris has definitely been intact for the fact that both of her parents were born in other countries. Um, as an immigration scholar, though, Chris, I was thinking when you were talking about the Gilded Age and not necessarily stoking racial division, I was thinking that was the period that the United States started rapid immigration period. rapid yeah. restrictionism on immigration I, I, i'm not denying the johnson read it i'm not i'm not saying that that's not the case what i'm saying is it wasn't at the behest of plutocrats that's what i'm saying right uh, <laughs> so i i i have a question for everybody because now that you know my pet my pet uh, concern around immigration has been well discussed um, I would love to hear a little bit more from Paul and Jacob about how gender is refracting this. Because yeah. it, I mean, we <laughs> see it in all the polls. Clearly, women are breaking differently than men, at least white women, white men. I think 
beyond the white population, it's probably much more just homogenous um, in terms of, of strong sort of anti-Trump feeling. Um, and is, is this, I think it's hard to say that this is just a matter of, of racial status. It's, it's very much sort of maybe a crisis of masculinity. I mean, I, I'd love to hear a little bit about how gender and potential crises of masculinity play into this toxic mix of politics. I'll say. Uh, it's women who have been organizing <laughs> during this period, and even among Latinos and African Americans, to the degree that there is a little bit of bleeding toward the Republicans and Trump, it is young men. It is definitely young men. Um, can I stick one more thing in there just so everybody can talk about it? I forgot to argue that I don't think the Ziblatt um, framework is as effective as this book makes it. Because if you're going to compare the German and the British elites in the 19th century, British conservatives had the advantage of a successful empire and victories in one major war after another. German authoritarianism uh, and the turn toward increasingly anti-democratic uh, things in Germany uh, was very much fueled by the loss in ma one major war after another. And we have to look at geopolitics, and that really bothers me even more than leaving out 80-20, because I think to the degree that we're seeing elite defections from the final step in the Republican turn toward anti-majoritarianism, we're seeing it in the foreign policy and international policy establishment that understands the terrible beating America's place in the world as a sort of a soft empire is taking under Trump and is reluctant to give up. So you have to bring that in. You, you cannot, conservative parties are accommodate democracy much better when they need soldiers to fight wars, mass wars, they need to educate, they need to have health care, they need, uh, that we've seen that and we saw that in the Civil War in the United States, we saw that in World War II. Um, and uh, so, so, so I think that's a really nice critique of Ziblatt. I think you should write that up. Um, well, but you didn't make it. You no, used him. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm complimenting you. I don't know why. I don't know why you're jumping on me when I when I'm complimenting you. Um, I think that's a really nice point. You should write it up. And I was just starting to speak, right? So maybe I'll have some other things to say about that. I think actually, if you did, I mean, we did not go into that element in the book among all the other things that we did not go into in the, in the book. Uh, had we done so, I think you would have to say, gee, compared with what Germany experienced, uh, the, the setbacks in the US, which still at the time when Donald Trump became president, right, was you know, clearly the dominant superpower, the only superpower, um, you know, that it, it's hard to say that that explains why you get this explosion of extreme right-wing politics in the U.S. when you compare it with those two cases. But I, I, I think that I think it, you're, you're right to say the different setting of British conserv conservatism and geopolitics and German conservatism and geopolitics, that's obviously hugely important. But I think what one would take from Ziblatt, and again, we're not saying I would be the last person to argue uh, that you can take historical events lifted from radically different contexts and just say you're going to replicate that. Um, what I think is powerful in Ziblatt for contemporary purposes is just to say, look, conservative par parties face real challenges in mass democracies. And an important element of those challenges right, is uh, that uh, they tend to be more on the side of economic elites and particularly in contexts where there are huge gaps between the interests of economic elites and ordinary citizens, that's gonna be a problem for them, right? And they are going to deal with that by accentuating second dimension issues, right? And he doesn't, that's just logic. That is what they're going to do, right? Um, and you can see it all over the place. And there's, there's good comparative uh, evidence on this. It shows that as, as inequality grows, we cite these studies in our work, as inequality grows, that conservative parties lean more heavily on social, on social divisions, right, as a way of galvanizing support. The, I think in some ways this gets to a core of a lot of what we've been 
talking around in this conversation. The next part of Ziblatt's argument is that weak conservative political parties are likely to engage in a practice of outsourcing outrage. So I'm glad you like chapter three of the book, Theodore. We like chapter three of the book, right? And the point is not to say that this is all top down. I have to say it's interesting because I actually see this analysis as the most Scotch Paulian analysis that Jacob and I have done, right? Because it is trying to make an effort to say this is not all top down, um, but nor is it all bottom up. And uh, yes, one has to understand as American behaviorists have actually done a pretty good job. I mean, I have some nits to pick, but I won't get in, into them now. I, I actually do think economic anxiety plays a role and that we lose sight of that. I know you're shaking your head, Chris, but, and we lose sight of that when we put uh, the ways in which large parts of the country are falling behind economically into some kind of 100 meter dash race with racial resentment. I don't think that's the right way to think about where economic anxiety fits into this picture. But, the, but mostly we're in agreement with all of you about what's happening on the bottom up side of the story. But what we're emphasizing is that those things have to be mobilized. They have to be organized into politics, that that is not a completely elite controlled project, but elites have enormous uh, influence over it, which is part of the reason why these social movements can flip from Tea Party rhetoric to Trumpian rhetoric, which is radically different in a very, very short period of time even though both these things happened against the backdrop of Obama's election. So let you me think just... Tea Party rhetoric and Trumpian rhetoric are radically different? I, I do. Swear. I don't see anybody oh. waving pocket constitutions. I don't see anybody talking about the deficit and how it's destroying the country. You're believing the New York Times version of the Tea Party. I read your book, the Theodore. Version. I read your book. Okay. okay. I, I'm going to give Jacob a chance. Yes, exactly. And Jacob, if you want to talk about the riflemen and the men in the riflemen, yeah, that's feel what, free to I do, do so. Want to. Yeah. I do want yeah. to. Um, yeah. I mean, so I, I, so after chapter three, there's also chapter four. And chapter four is a lot about the sort of uh, building of identity. Plutocracy and identity is the title of it. And um, it obviously could say a lot more about gender, but it is quite notable, I think, the extent to which, and, and this is, comes out really clearly in a book that we draw on called The Long Southern Strategy, which I really loved. Um, and it's about the extent to which sort of, they say that there are kind of three things that get twined together in this, um, in what, in this sort of, ex, this export from the Nixon campaign that becomes tied so we point out, right, Nixon in 1968 uses all this politics of racial backlash, but he couples it with big expansions of social security and a very moderate and even pro-labor economic agenda, right? But this long Southern strategy marries, and Lee Atwater is the key figure that we talk about, this long Southern strategy marries those, racial, those issues of racial and cultural backlash, which involves uh, definitely big backlash about family change and the shifting position of men, um, which um, gains strength and, and, and um, in um, the, the, as deindustrialization um, uh, begins and, and intensifies after 2000. Um, it definitely includes this really strong element of, um, I don't know what you want to call it, white male, uh, white male backlash. And, um, and so, that, you know, so there's a lot of ways to look at that. And one of them, of course, is just the simple gender gap, which is, uh, which start, which really starts to show up in the, in the, in the Reagan administration, but just um, it amplifies and is ve was very, very large in the run up to Trump. It also shows up, I think, in the types of organizations that we write about, the NRA, uh, the Christian right, and, um, and especially right wing media. These are uh, incredibly, uh, they're, they're strong, association between these organizations and a kind of a certain image of masculinity. So I wish I could, I wish we had done more on that. And I think it's really fascinating. And certainly Trump was sort of uniquely positioned to um, both exploit and benefit from that. But of course, the double edged sword of that is that he also has been uniquely vulnerable um, to the extent to the extent that there has, as, as Theta was saying, there's been this uh, in mass mobilization that has um, been spearheaded by women against his administration. So um, I want to just say one thing um, about 
because I wanted to say about it, but I was really trying to stick to time about this economic insecurity and, and inequality versus, um, versus racial resentment and race, racial backlash. So one is just, a, our, at the structural level, I think our argument is sound. That is to say that rising inequality is part of the reason why themes of, of racial backlash are being exploited more and more by the Republican Party. But I also think at the individual level, there's actually um, good evidence. There's um, a really, there's a study that you probably know, Chris, from David Ator and his colleagues that looks at the, the China shock. And that's basically this exogenous shift in the, the, uh, in the terms of trade with China that hurt particular parts of the country, right? And we know what parts they are. These are often small towns and rural areas that were once manufacturing powerhouses. And what he shows is when these places are, are uh, majority non-white or you know, very diverse, then you get a big shift to kind of left wing, left wing populist, if that's, sorry, um, politicians. When they are really white or really close to it, you get conservative Republicans winning, right? And the, the point I would make is only that there's, there's clearly an argument here about the mediating role of race, but it's the economic shocks that do help make that a more intense backlash. And that's the point. I wouldn't, I would, I don't like the individual horse race because I think it's a much more, it's much more occurring in a spatial way that Theta has drawn attention to it because of the ways in which um, uh, non-urban areas, right, have, they have middle class and comfortable people in them, but the places have been disproportionately and, and negatively affected by a lot of these transformations. And this might be a, a, another place where we could bring in usefully the Democrats' lack of a, of, a, of a really robust agenda as part of the reason why these Republicans have been able to, to benefit from these dislocations. We, thank you, Jacob. We are approaching the end of our time. And so I'm gonna suggest that we do the following. We're gonna have both of our commentators, critics, um, maybe push on one question that they would really uh, like to emphasize or um, have one comment. And then we'll let both Paul and Jacob um, give sort of a last response. And just for, for the general listening audience of, of everyone who's been listening in on our conversation, um, there's been people who have been commenting on, I'm just gonna, these are comments, not questions, but people have commented, Trump's economic nationalism is popular among his base as they are the victims of the Democratic Party's turn to globalization. So this issue, I guess, of, of economic grievance or at least a sense of economic grievance. Um, and uh, Kristen Luker points out that Obama might have represented both racial animosity, I can't pronounce that word, and class anxiety as he represents uh, what Theta calls the 20% in terms of also the meritocracy. And we could maybe think of Kamala Harris in the same way. So I'm going to first ask Chris to have his one question comment because he wanted to go in front of Theta, not behind. And then Theta will get her last comment or question. And then we're gonna end with Paul and Jacob, Chris. Thank you. Uh, wonderful discussion, you guys. I'm just going to leave you guys with this, and then I would like to maybe carry this conversation offline because I have some other uh, comments I'd like to offer. Um, on the on, so on the economic anxiety thing, yes, it is definitely mediated by racial racial anxiety, no doubt about that, right? And there are many reasons for that, and I can elaborate on that at some other point in time. But what I really like to push back on, if you guys don't mind, is sort of answering a question about how this framework would apply to the Gilded Era. Right, uh, social movements is a whole different thing. I want to ask about that, but I'm more curious about this. And since that, and, and because we have, you know, extremes of, of inequality, you know, like right before we hit the Great Depression, um, and but we still don't we don't get these plutocrats lining up, you know, with these right wingers um, and pushing, you know, these you know anti-immigrant or you know anti-black um, tropes or threats at that point in time. Um, so anyway, that's and I'm well aware. Uh, I'm really aware, Irene, about, you know, what was happening, you know, in an early part of the 20th century about all the anti-immigrant legislation, but it was not at the behest of the plutocrats. So that's all I got. All right, Theda. You know, because this is a social science forum, I'm going to say that, of course, it's not appropriate to say to authors of a book or article, well, you didn't describe this, you didn't describe that, you didn't describe the other thing. 
And I just want to be clear that that's not what I'm trying to do here. I think it's perfectly appropriate in a book of this kind to exaggerate a line of argument in order to hit people over the head with it. And I think you've done that in this book more than you have in any of the other books that make very similar arguments. So uh, you may not agree with that, but that's what I see uh, in this book. And I do think there's a very heavy emphasis on the top 1% and the top two, thir two thirds of the top 1% being able to control the dynamic over a several decade period. My point would be that it's important to understand several causal processes that intersect on different time scales and often in loosely coupled ways in order to be prepared to talk about when they come apart. And uh, so that is a theoretical point. I think Paul and Jacob will understand it very well if they think about it a, a bit. It's out of historical institutionalism. And that's my disagreement. And that's what I would push you to do, perhaps in academic articles, um, where you take not just uh, frameworks that you're applying or straw men that you disagree with, but really take a look at uh, multi-causal arguments about what's happened with the Republican Party. So that's my piece of advice there. Thank you very much, Theda. Um, we are past time, so we understand if some people have classes or need to go to their next appointments, but I do want to give both Paul and Jacob a chance to have some last brief comments to summarize or to leave with the audience, because this has been um, just an incredibly energetic and I would say fun Zoom conversation, and that does not happen often these days on Zoom. So I really want to thank everybody and then let Paul and Jacob have the last word since we are celebrating their book. Yeah. Super, super stimulating. Um, thank you, Irene, uh, for doing a, um, a great job of moderating a, a complicated um, conversation with um, where we want to get a, a lot of voices in. Um, I, so, so on Chris's point, <laughs> this is a, a longer, this is a really important uh, thing to think about, a longer conversation than we can have here. So be, I would love to um, take it offline as well. But I think, so, so the, but two things I think I would want to say about um, the early part of the 20th century. One is, of course, if you look at the South, right, which in many, which is an authoritarian enclave, as Rob Mickey puts it, within the United States during this period. It is very much organized around what we would call plutocratic populist lines, right? I mean, that is what it is, right? Um, and it generates authoritarianism, right? Now, in part because of that, right, because of that Jim Crow system and the way that it fit into the national party politics, the rest of it does not map out so cleanly, right? The American party system, involves different groups of plutocrats in two different parties, right? And you could say, and this I think would be a place where we could have a more elaborate conversation. To some extent, that's true now, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, though we think um, just as uh, the, uh, as Chap Snyder said, right? The flaw in the pluralist heaven is that it sinks with an upper class accent. Well, the, the flaw in the plutocrat and plutocratic pluralism is that it sinks with a very right wing accent. Um, more than 60-40, I would say, theta, but we could disagree with, disagree about that, but we've got a bunch of evidence about it in the book. Um, so, um, and then, so just the last thing on, on theta's very, very fair point for how to, how to think about this. I mean, obviously, obviously it's multi-causal, and we can disagree about the extent to which um, you think we have a monocausal explanation. I don't think we have a monocausal explanation, but we could argue about that. The way we try to set it up in the book, which I think is manageable for the kind of contribution that we're trying to make to the pu public discussion is, here are two dominant narratives about how we got to Donald Trump, right? One says the, the establishment, the Republican establishment is overthrown by the Trumpian populist attack. The other one says it's race all the way down. Right. And we say, excuse me, excuse me, we say um, the first narrative 
has a little bit of truth in it, but is mostly wrong. And the second narrative has a lot of truth in it, but is at best incomplete without really wrestling with the kinds of things that we're talking about in the book. All right, and Jacob. You have to unmute Jacob. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It wasn't that I knew I, it, it was, it was, I couldn't find my mouse. Uh, <laughs> I got so excited. I was like knocking everything all over the place. You know, one, I think when you, when you have a conversation that's as energetic as this, I mean, we didn't quite come up to the level of the first presidential debate, but we were moving in that direction. Um, one wants to end in, on, on a positive note. And, and I just want to thank both uh, Chris and Theta for, for reading the book so closely and for all the nice things they said before they laid in to us. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to say is that um, I want to push back against one argument and I want, I want to encourage people to read the book and decide whether I'm right, which is I really think this book helps us understand 2016 to 2020. And I actually think it really helps us see what's happened in the midst of the pandemic as well. Um, and which is not to say, and this is really important, um, that, um, that we had in any way foresaw what would happen. I think we'd be quite a bit more concerned in the absence of the pandemic about the ability of this particular configuration of power to persist um, into, um, into, the next, uh, into the next decade. Um, I, hope, I hope that we can take the term plutocratic populism, and Chris, I'm totally happy to throw right-wing populism in there, and bury it, um, and that we'll be thinking about other things. But I think if our argument is correct, that um, unless we address the extreme inequality that we have, um, that some of the same particular strains that we're talking about are going to keep recurring and, and threaten our democracy. All right, thank you very much, Jacob. And for everybody listening in, if you have not had a chance yet to pick up the book, hopefully this conversation will have whetted your appetite. If you look very carefully behind both Jacob and Paul, you'll see copies of the book right there. Um, let them eat tweets. And now I should thank the panelists. I should thank uh, our authors who were willing to be subject to criticism. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Marion if she wants to have some final comments on behalf of Matrix. Well, very, very shortly, uh, just to, to thank you all, uh, Paul and uh, Jacob, Chris and Theda and Irene for moderating. Um, and, uh, you know, that was uh, one of the most spirited and, and lively and, and very rich uh, discussion that I, we've had in, in a long time. And, you know, let's hope that the added insights uh, will pay off in real life. Uh, and, and sooner uh, than later. So without further ado, I, I just bid you all goodbye. Thank, thank you again. And thank you for, the, for all of you for, for listening. And uh, join us again as soon as next week. Join us on Twitter and everywhere else. Thank you. Thank you.